Okay, this Veterans History Project interview uh, is being conducted on uh, Thursday, September the 16th in the year 2010 here at the Niles Public Library. Um, we're sitting in the, uh, in the boardroom. Um, my name is Neil O'Shea, and I'm privileged to be speaking with Mr. Jerry Levin. Uh, Mr. Levin was born on uh, March the 31st, uh, 1925. Uh, he served in the United States Army in the Pacific, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. Uh, and I must say we're uh, especially grateful that uh, Mr. Levin has uh, gone to quite a bit of effort here to, uh, to organize his, uh, his library of experiences and uh, memorabilia. And here at this big round table, uh, uh, Mr. Levin is sitting behind a beautiful uh, uh, framed plaque with all his many medals testifying to his uh, service to his country in the Pacific, and there are pictures of himself in, uh, with other soldiers in a mug and uh, articles from the battlefield and a Japanese sword so, um, and two binders. So uh, Mr. Levin is well prepared, and it'd be uh, wonderful to hear his story. Um, so Mr. Levin, do you remember Pearl Harbor Day? Do you remember that? Yes. And uh, you were aware that there was a, perhaps a war in the offing. Uh, aware as any teenager might be. Yeah. So, um, do you recall when you entered the service? Yes. Uh, I went to basic training uh, uh, in the Signal Corps in Camp Van Dorn, Mississippi. And um, before entering the service, were you had you just graduated from high school? Well, or? I went to. Uh, I had just graduated. Went to Loyola pre med became a pediatrician eventually uh, and retired from that aspect. And then uh, the draft just, uh, they were starting to push on the offensive, so they started to draft heavily. Prior to that, I went to enlist in the Marines, but I had flat feet and they wouldn't take me, so I ended up in the Army Infantry. But the Army would take flat feet? Oh, yeah. And why had you been interested in the Marines to begin yeah, with? Pretty uniform. Pretty uniform. <laughs> wow. So had you had you graduated like in mid-year uh, or something? Uh, like January, uh, February. Yeah, yeah, February. Nowadays it seems like the the students all normally graduate in in May or June, but it seems in that World War II period, uh, yeah. it was not uncommon. You to finished in June, you had the summer off, and then you went back in September. Yeah. So you had graduated. Uh, February, and, and then they picked me up in September. And they picked you up in September. Yeah. And then you mentioned your uh, your basic training was down? Camp Van Dorn, Mississippi. Camp Van Dorn, Mississippi. Um, how did your, your family, how did, how did your family, was your, was your family upset or worried about you or anybody else at home? Well, or? Uh, of course. They, yeah. they never uh, manifested in any way, like, crying, it was, mm -hmm. shook hands at the railroad station with my brother, who was, oddly enough, uh, it's ironic, I was expecting that anything could happen at any time. He was killed in a high school football game, and I shook hands with him at the train station, and that was the last I saw of him. Well, so you were the eldest son then, or the, yeah. yeah. The, um, so that much, was that your first time away from home? Pretty much. That must have been an interesting experience, being in another part of the country with folks from all over the place. Oh, it was an eye-opener. And in the spree de corps with whoever you met, everyone had the same idea. Someone did something wrong to our country, and it had to be corrected. So there was a great sense of uh, patriotism. No doubt about it. I, uh, So you didn't find basic training too difficult or? Uh... No, there were uh, always a comrade doing something with you, uh, crawling under barbed wire, machine gun fire over your head, jumping in a hole and having a tank run over it with another guy. He didn't panic and I didn't panic and we talked about college. He had gone to college for a brief period. The tank rolled over us and after they rolled over we got out. And, yeah. uh, all the basic stuff. but. Then that division, they started uh, for a push, and they broke up that division. Half of them went to Germany, and half went to the Pacific as replacements to fulfill 
uh, another active division. So was the 77, but the 77th, this illustrious division that you wound up with, they were, all of the 77th was in the, was in the Pacific? All of the 77th was yeah. in the Pacific. Did you have any feelings about going to Europe versus going to the Pacific? Well, I, I was not keenly aware of politics, but I knew there was something going on that was horrific. And uh, I didn't know much about the, the Pacific except what movies I saw with Robert Ryan and showing the Japs as very cruel people. So I think about it and say, how the heck am I going to deal with that? Yeah, there were fears and thoughts. And uh, so, after your uh, basic training, were you sent then to another another spot? Camp Pickett, Virginia. Camp Pickett, Virginia. Where they uh, filled in all the uh, replacements for the 77th Division, weeded out who could go and who couldn't go. So at that time, you they, you knew that you were going to be in the uh, in the infantry. Yeah. But one thing I must say, I was privileged to get into an anti-tank platoon, which the line companies were attached, had heavier weapons, such as a armor-piercing 50 caliber machine gun, a bazooka, satchel charges to throw under the treads of tanks, uh, your rifles, your grenades, the ammunition, anti-personnel shells, and uh, so forth and so on. And that put me at the call of the line companies. And they're the people that looked for someone to kill and someone looked to kill them. And if they ran into a tank or needed a heavy weapon, they would call up the anti-tank uh, squad and they'd come with the weapons that could help them. So, so that difference was a big difference, 50 yards away from anything in a line company is a big buffer. So that was a very good. I did face a number of issues and so forth, but uh, that gave me the buffer, probably saved my life in, in a sense. Yeah. So that was it. So you did you have to receive specialized training to be yeah. in a sort of anti tank And was yeah. that at Camp Pickett or? Uh, that was uh, at, afterwards in Hawaii. In Hawaii. And then from Camp Pickett, you get you catch a boat from the west coast to uh, Camp Stoneman and out under the Golden Gate Bridge. Beautiful sight. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. But trepidation because you're going in the wide Pacific. Yeah. So did you still have a couple of buddies with you who had been through? Phil Hensley was my closest buddy, but there were a group of about six men that were close, and to this day we've often got together. Now nobody's left except one sergeant and myself. So uh, then, um, so from Hawaii then, you head for the, is it the Philippines or Hawaii, Guam or? They then uh, zigzagged across, uh, well, zigzagged to Hawaii, took us about two weeks, put us in jungle training, and then uh, from there shipped us out to possibly land at uh, they were having trouble in Saipan, getting things under control. So they headed us there. Then things got under control, and they swung us around to land uh, with the Marines in Guam. And uh, that was the first action. We so had a saying, here today, Guam tomorrow. Very good. So at Guam, did the Marines go in first then? And then no, the we went in with the Marines. Uh, it was so bad that we had a circle till about three or four in the morning. So when we got there, there were dead guys uh, all over the place, Japanese and Americans, and it kind of took the wind out of your sails when you saw that. That was the first time you'd seen dead? Well, yeah, so that yeah. such masses, and that's that picture here in this book, if you feel like taking it. Yeah, we'll copy. get a copy of that yeah. and try and uh, reference it in the interview. And then we started to go in. And uh, the anecdotes are. Yeah. Could the Marines? Would your would your anti-tank unit? Would you ever be called in to help the Marines? That uh, often, if the Marines needed uh, armor like a tank, they had their own. They had their own landing crafts. 
their own medical signal artillery tank support and if if for instance an army outfit needed a tank and they weren't using it they could call them and they worked together uh, after you're on the ground everyone's the same uh, trying to do what they have to do when it ought to be done whether they like it or not and if you there's a coordination between units that helped and if you run up against the pillbox and uh, you need a flamethrower and you don't have any uh, you call to see if the Marines had anything available and so forth so there was that and we got along with them pretty well and uh, then I, I can have, tell you anecdotes after we get in so then from Guam you well, Guam wasn't finished. Guam, everything was new to me. We we were on a hill in the morning and hadn't seen anybody. We dug into a, a Japanese trench, and it was so damn cold, I didn't know if, whether I was shaking from fear that someone would jump into there or from the cold. Woke up in the morning, things seemed all right, and guys were sitting around on the hill until one guy got hit with a shrapnel that exploded in the groin. Then everybody learned, you don't stand around waiting for something to happen, you, you know. Then we started to go down a, a road, and it was, uh, the whole column was stopped because the machine gun was at the end of the column, and it fired some guy in the face, and they stopped the whole column. And the officer said, hey, there's some shacks over there. Uh, you three guys go over and take a look. So we approached it through a, a sugarcane field that had been flattened, and we come into some straw huts like on, on stilts, and there's a, like a nice box, but meat hanging from a, a hook, a Japanese helmet like someone had just taken off out of there, Flies were on the damn thing. It's funny what you look at. So we started going in, and we went into a grass hut. For what reason, I don't know, to check it out. And under a blanket in the hut, there was movement. So the three of us were standing there with the guns ready. And we looked at each other, and then someone lifted the blanket. They were under a blanket-like cover and lifted a pistol. Then there was firing like mad. And we left that little hut, and the blood started pouring down between the slats of this bamboo-like floor. When I saw that, I started to get pretty nauseous, and uh, that affected me. And we came back to the lieutenant, and he talked to us, and then the column moved on. But uh, that was a real eye-opener, and something you're not used to, seeing blood cone all over people moving and yelling. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering what my part was in there. To this day, I was wondering if I shot into that mass of people or not. I hope I didn't. I hope the other two guys did. Yeah. But Were those Japanese soldiers then, do you think, hiding in there? Yeah, they had helmets all over the place. They, they had a, a record machine that played some American songs. It was uh, such a weird setting yeah. that it stuck in my brain. Bright sunlight and bright red blood flowing out, and and my I turned pale, and uh, and soon uh, it quelled, and it became just a memory bank. Yeah. And it's up there, always to be withdrawn. Yeah. But what for? What purpose now? It, there's nothing heroic about it. It's just that you were there, and this is what you were supposed to do. Then the column went on, and we sat down on the road because the column stopped again. <laughs> Jeez, there's the dead Jap across the road about three, four yards. A pig is eating his dead toe. A frog is sitting on top of his eyeball, flies all over. And I thought, well, it's a good time for me to open the can of egg yolk. And I opened the damn can. And the flies decided they're going to sit on my spoon. And I had to shoo them away, and I ate my egg yolk, and I got the worst damn dysentery you ever had. Shit all over. Yeah. 
some toilet paper they gave us, like chocolate bars. I didn't smoke. I traded it for moldy chocolate bars. And so that is part of uh, the life of an infantry. It's not always killing. It's often seen dead stuff and malaria, dengue fever, dysentery, the whole nine yards. You're a foreigner in that land. Run out of adamant tablets on Leyte, run out of water, and no hot coffee at night. Nobody turns on a light. Nobody sings songs. No news. In the middle of nowhere, and the rain was always there, which reminds me, we, they put the gun, 37 millimeter anti-tank, on the horseshoe bend in the road, and in the middle of the horseshoe was a hill. We were on top of it. If anything came down that hill, we had an armor-piercing 50 caliber up there. And I sat in, in a foxhole about two, six feet by two feet with a parapet on it, and it rained. It rained. I don't know how many days on Guam, it seemed like almost all, and it was cold rain at night. Sat in, in the water up to my belly button. Another guy was behind me, the ugliest man I ever saw in my <laughs> life, and we were sat close together for body warmth. And I had to take a pee, but nobody gets out of the hole that it tracks movement and you're gone. So I peed, and it felt good, because I felt the warm, the warm pee yeah. around my groin. I said, wow, the guy in back of me, with his legs around me, he peed too. And his warm pee felt good too on my back. That's infantry. Didn't see a tank, didn't fire a shot, but the living was abominable. And I, I just remember it. I didn't think much more about it, right, wrong, or what it was, was. And that, uh, that was mostly a part of Guam. There's other anecdotes that once we carried the anti-tank weapons. We bet down with the Marines the first night. We run it. Uh, we got lost. Someone said, we'll carry the anti-tank gun, no wheels. How are you going to use wheels in a jungle? Everything is mud. So a tripod, 55 pounds, a breech block, 57 pounds, the barrel, 55 pounds, three canisters of anti-packed and rosin uh, steel balls for anti-personnel shots, anti-armor-piercing shells, three of them in the back, a couple of hand grenades, your poncho, a day's supply of Cracker Jack boxes, two canteens of water, your rifle, a couple of bandoliers, and we couldn't keep up with the line companies we were assigned to, so we got lost. And what do we come across? A squad of Marines bedded down. They had their weapons, and they looked at us. We looked at them, uh, and we weren't going anywhere. We didn't know where to go. Uh, the guy, the Marine, said, you want to get in with us? We said, sure. So we set up a 50 caliber machine gun, set up an anti-personnel thing, the Marines were happy to have the firepower. They said they're coming across this rice or, or cane field from over there, and they're just going to come at us. And uh, we're glad to have you here. They were just kids like us, and, and they were happy. And here comes a runner. says, where the hell you guys been? Well, we, we couldn't keep up with the like, L Company. And he says, the captain wants you up over here. So. The Marines sadly saw us pack our gear and move out. But we uh, had a nice relationship because when push came to shove, everyone was doing the same thing. So that was that was mostly Guam. I probably forgot to tell you a number of instances. They're all pictorially in the brief here. But uh, Guam was an important thing to get. That was our Central Pacific, the Marianas, to get an airstrip, and from there get another airstrip, and another airstrip, and so forth and so on. Anyway, that, that's some of the anecdotes about that. I, so you recovered from the dysentery, and yeah, did well, they give you a, a dysentery? The best thing about it, if you can stay hydrated, as a physician, in the who of uh, pediatrics, all you got to do, even if you give a dropper full of liquid, keep up with your losses. How do you get cured? 
you shut everything out. All the bugs go out. It's nature's way of taking all the bad stuff out. But you got to stay hydrated. When you get dehydrated, that's when you die. Did they give you a, a little rest after Guam or anything? Or? Yeah, after Guam, uh, we, we took a number of casualties. They, they uh, decided to send us to New Caledonia. But we got, uh, on the way, things changed. Uh, New Caledonia was far. They uh, took us by way of uh, Enoetok and Kwajalein, and we, uh, I dove off the bow of the ship. I was crazy. I don't know how far down I went. Beautiful water. They were atolls. And then we went down. This is why I spent 130 days at sea, from Enoetok and Kwajalein we then went to Manus Island in the Admiralty Islands, just off of New Guinea, where there were outriggers and the natives were red hair and pink eyes. And uh, they let us off on Manus Island. We had a can of beer, played a game of volleyball, called us back to the ships, and got us going back to Leyte, where they were going to have the invasion. So instead of a longer rest, they resupplied us and so forth, and headed back for the invasion of uh, Ormark Bay. I didn't spend much time in the Philippines, because right off the boat, we went inland, and uh, there was a lot of action, and I got shot, and they sent me back to New Guinea. You were hit with a, a Japanese bullet? Rifle, yeah. Rifle. I heard a crack, and I think they, uh, I don't know, if the guy went higher, I had no kids, because it would have hit me, yeah. and it would have hit a bone, but it didn't. And I saw, you know, I got back to him. It was a long haul back. They didn't have, it took me, what happens is there's eight men. When you're wounded, four come to carry you, and four come to protect the guys carrying you. So they, they didn't care about Red Crosses, so they had a target of eight guys. Uh, they dropped my litter, and the, the bullets were pecking around it, and they finally got me into a, a coconut grove uh, where we were in control. They got me back onto a road with four guys, put the litter down on the road, and they, uh, a guy was coming like hell, a three-quarter ton truck, stopped the truck, was filled with water cans. He said, take this guy to a mash unit. And they put me on the water cans, which was a hell of a ride, uh -oh. bumping all over the place. Little did I know that I was also coming down with malaria because we had had no adabrine, had no clear water, and they uh, took me back to a mass unit. And by comparison, it was a macabre scene. I don't think that a mass uh, 4177, like uh, portrayed in the TV series, can ever bring what what goes on in there guys' legs coming off, pieces all over the place, and they make it romantic, and the surgeons are going, ha, 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 and having coffee with the big blonde on TV, or showing Sinatra and Wayne killing everybody around and staying at home and going to the Hollywood cafe in the morning. What a bunch of bullshit. So they took the innocent lambs, and they put them in, and the innocent lambs Fortunately, had a feeling for the country that you had to take take it away from these bad guys. So that's all aside, but it, it strikes me here and there. And so I was. Uh, so the malaria and then the leg wounds. I went into coma. For yeah, that had, had to hit. Yeah. Well, I was getting an alcohol bath one day in in a Quonset hut that was filled with guys, and then I don't re I lost a week. I found, woke up, it's another macabre story, even in a hospital. There are several types of, four main types of malaria. Falciparum is a non-recurrent type. The, the ova, they hide in the liver, so you can't give a transfusion because you might be given malaria. But self falciparum, you can develop a coma and go out. If you make out after the coma, that's good. Then there's uh, Plasmodium malariae and Vivax malariae and Malaria malariae. There's subtypes. And I had no adabrin. And so 
I went in the coma. I woke up in the quantum but nobody else was in there. They isolated me. Big empty thing. I wake up, no clothes on, mosquito netting up, and I got such awful cramps. And I yelled and swore, no nurse, nobody. So there was a bed next to mine. I lifted the mosquito netting. I was weak as hell. I had an IV running. I got a toe on a bedpan and held myself up as best I could and aimed to take a crap in the, the bedpan. And then walks a cute little nurse. Well, I let her go. I, Son of a bitch, where the hell you been? Here I am taking the shit coming out of me and embarrassed as hell and weak as hell. And so I let it rip. So even in the illness, there's a bunch of stuff. Well, I came back. I spent about two months in the getting, getting better, throwing beer cans at a screen with Frank Sinatra on it and John Wayne. Did the other men feel the same way too, I suppose? They threw the cans too, sure. These were two jerks pretending they're great military, doing marvelous pictures for everybody to show them how it was. Did they show me shitting in a bedpan with a nurse walking in? Yeah. Did they get the stink of my shit? Do you, do you think the, the generals knew that these kind of films were not necessarily that positive for the, the men? generals, read Vonnegut's thing. He yeah. said, war is made by old men for young children. Yeah. And the old men, what do they do? They tell you where to go. They tell you what to do. They put you in harm's way. Do you think that in division headquarters, which is 15 miles away from anything the line company does? For Christ's sake. You don't see them up there. When they do come up there, you look at some of uh, Malden's cartoons. Oh, yeah. The, the general standing there, one of them got killed, uh, Buckner, I think. Yeah, Shrek. Okinawa, yeah. Uh, they stand up like, uh, and two guys are, are telling the general in Malden's cartoon, Willie and Joe, they're lying as flat as they can. They said, General, said, why don't you sit down or something? You're drawing fire. But, you know, they come up to see what it's like, like Percy went to, to see what the one war was in. You know, oh, I was, I was in Vietnam. I took a look there. Mm, boy, oh, boy. Oh, you brave. You go back just like these survivor things. If they say, I quit surviving, I want the cameraman to give me his hamburger. Surviving is sticking to what you have to in the face of all the danger, not running away. Yeah. And that's about all I did. There's no big heroics. Bill Hensley got a silver star. He was a magnificent Oregonian fella who did a lot of nice stuff. And it was visualized. The next star up is the Medal of Honor, which you've got to be witnessed. Uh, some guys have cuts like that. I, I couldn't. After I was shot, I, I lost that... Uh, well, I never had it in the first place. Phil was a magnificent soldier. Well, you weren't dying to get back into the into the front line when you were Well, on Aishima, in which such was a pretty pitched battle with bonsai attacks, we were ahead of ourselves. But I remember uh, they, there were narrow in villages, uh, brick walls like cinder block, maybe about six feet high at a narrow pathway. <clears throat> and they sent uh, four guys down to pick up uh, the officers did a body of an officer and the whole squad was dead in their place uh, one on each side alternated and the, the officer was dead with his bullet in his brains in the helmet so we put him on the, the stretcher and I had an eerie feeling there were some Jap gunners at the head of the row perpendicular right in the face of what, and the two guys, it must have been a hand grenade or something, they were there arm in arm and the bottom half of their bodies gone. And they were sitting by a machine gun. And I couldn't get it out of my mind that someone was watching the whole thing. We took this guy's body and he kept slipping off because I had a spasm in my shoulder. They said, Levin, for Christ's sake, I had my neck up because I was frightened. They said, pick up your end, the guy's slipping off. And I said, I can't. I, you know, I remember these stupid things, just plain fear. 
we get to the top of our position, everyone comes over to see the dead officer, and a machine gun opens up and he knocks one guy's arm off, and the guys lie, everyone scattered, and then they started firing back of us. Uh, they had coordinated something. There was a big pit with two guys in it firing, and, and so it was like chaos. I jumped in the hole, and uh, Jesus, this other guy was laying out there screaming. I said, God, if someone ought to take him out. I had the right idea, but I said, Phil, I can't do it. He says, I'll, I'll get him. He walked out there in the middle of the fire and brought the guy into safety. Got nothing for it. He did something else that was quite spectacular, but that was an open hour. But that's the kind of partner I had. Yeah. Intrepid. Intrepid. And didn't he just did the right thing. He didn't care about medals or anything. One sweet guy. Never heard him swear like I do. Because afterwards we were, you know, my job when we were at a place and it was quiet, late they was captured. What do you think they had me doing? Digging a garbage pit, a garbage pit, 12 by 12 by 12 by 8 feet, right outside the Padre's tent. With every shovelful, I swore like a Comanche, and the Irish here came out like O'Shea. Yeah. Uh, Flynn, I think his last name, he says, The father, the Padre, he hears all you fellas swearing. Can't you cut it out now, you boys? And he said, Sure, sure. So he <laughs> went back up there and started swearing again. Then the next thing, you need a 12-hole latrine. Who do you think dug it? I dug it. You needed water trucks to be loaded. I became pretty strong. They wanted me to go in a boxing team at one time. But those were the things, that's part of a war. You're not always firing. Most of the time, you're suffering. And then when it's over, a few nice things come into play. Some better food, quietude, a dry pair of socks and a uniform. You know, they deloused us and they gave us new fatigues. And uh, it's, uh, so th that's the kind of life that should be brought up. And still having in mind that you're doing something you think is appropriate for the times. I wouldn't like to see it. I wouldn't like my grandkids in it. I wouldn't like them what I just alluded to. And yet there are people out there, even today, Although I don't want to fight with them, I hope they can negotiate. That would be the beauty. Politicians have a great responsibility and something they can do good. Talking, maybe. Yeah, like yes. Kurt Vonnegut, but the way he sees humanity, if there's a religion that says, we're going to banish you. How do you, how do you negotiate, yeah? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. All I can say is, like a Boy Scout model, be prepared. Incidentally, I was also an Eagle Scout. An Came Eagle back, Scout? Well, twice. I had all the merit badges and everything. But when I came back, another friend of mine, we went back to the old camp we used to go to, Camp Stewart in Michigan. And we got uh, to a board for uh, Eagle Scout, finish it off. We were, life was the one thing that... So the guy said, hey, listen, tell him a couple of war stories, and I'll give you your eagle badge. <laughs> so we, we made up stuff. And did, the, did the scouting background, did that help at all in the Army? Or well, a uh, bit? to this extent, it was an outdoor activity. We had great, great people in it. And uh, so I was outdoor. Uh, one of the marriage badge was uh, cooking. And they sent you out. Uh, you had a... a get two Y sticks, green, stick them in the ground, get a Y green stick across, hang a pot of water up and get it to boil. Well, how do you do that? You dig a hole in the ground and it rained. You had to get the bark off the inside of a tree for tinder, thin, dry pieces. And in Michigan, they had plenty of flint. You found a good piece and you struck it and sparks would go off. Well, it took me the whole day almost. I, imagine, yeah. I got dizzy from blowing at it. Finally, the stuff was dry. A few of the little tinders started to light up. And I put in my hand. I put it in the hole, got it more, and then added quickly some little sticks that were dry. And I got the water to boil. So I got that merit badge. In a sense, uh, that took me out of the city into a camp 
which is essentially what the Army is, into camaraderie. And I think the scout movement has some good qualities, but with all the shenanigans about priests are no good, scoutmasters are no good, nobody's no good. But the scout law is no good either, just like I read Vonnegut, someone say in a computer thing, uh, we ought to uh, give our constitution to some of these uh, other people because we're not using it. And we're not using the scout law. You know why? Because a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, and brave, clean, and reverent. And you shouldn't do that today. Wow. So I'm commenting on our society. Well, that's the way it is. I come from another time. And I feel they could pick up some of those things and stop being so bearded, so smelly, and so cocky about what they want from life. Well, I better shut up. No, no. no. I'm getting philosophy. Now it flesh, fleshes out the interview. Um, so Iyashima, then, that's an, an island Iyashima. just off of Iyashima. Just Iyashima, uh, this cup will tell you where the 77th was. Yeah. In the First World War, they were the, the Muse Ants. Baccarat, Muse, Aragon, and the Lost Battalion was out of the 307th, I believe, uh, regiment. They were surrounded by the Germans. For uh, for us was Guam, Leyte, uh, Karemareto, Okinawa, and Aishima. Aishima had a, uh, a, 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 la a landing field, but we had the air covered so they couldn't get any planes up, so they took their bombs that the airplanes covered, they dug them into the sides of roads in a little metal uh, tip showing. And it was the uh, line companies that came across them and tied a little white triangular ribbon around. I admire those guys because they're looking for all the stuff. By the time you get there, there's the ribbon. We had our gun on wheels, the 37 millimeter gun, and then machine gun fire opened and a tank blew up across a field, and our, uh, the bullets were hitting our jeep, so I dove around behind one of the rear wheels, and the, the, our great sergeant, uh, he's gone now, Stump from Pennsylvania, he jumped behind the other, we were talking about this when I last saw him, and we had a jeep with about three wounded on it. And they were backing up on the road to turn around to take these guys out. And there was a guy in back of the Jeep, and he says, OK, OK, hold it, hold it. It was a soft shoulder to the road. The Jeep rolled onto one of these mines and blew up. And a guy's boot came off or his leg. I, 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 I don't know. It started to happen all around again, chaos. And I was talking to stuff. He says, yeah, I remember that. He, I said, I was in front of the front two wheels, and you were in the rear two wheels. So, if, and they had, uh, so we couldn't move our gun up, which was a good thing, because the company went ahead, and across the field, they had a bonsai attack, and they could not count the Japs. They did, decided to better count a pancreas, because legs were all over. They soon gave that up on Okinawa. They got smart. No more of that running at you and screaming and swearing. And uh, we had even the guy who was in, uh, like, quartermaster. And he says, tonight's the night. He was an Irish or two. You're going to die. But they had machine guns on each flank. And, and almost nothing happened to the company. And all the Japs died. I, that was pathetic. And they stopped at Okinawa. They they really got the smarts. Yeah. They said, we're going to bloody you. Maybe we'll get better at peace terms. Yeah. And in, loose, in Manila, they purposely killed 100,000 innocent people just out of meanness because they knew the war was over. Uh, all kinds of stuff. How innocent we were. You know, uh, we were on Cebu getting ready to arm to go into Japan and uh, replacing whatever we had, and then they dropped the bomb. Out of the woods came 5,000 regiment of Japanese. We didn't even know they were there. They came with their arms. There's a picture in here of all these guys lined up. They surrendered. They want to go home, too. And uh, 
I couldn't imagine uh, some kind of bomb. I said, gee, boy, that must be some bomb. Who the hell knew from an atomic bomb? So there must have been some feeling of relief then with the... There was joy, exhilaration, drunkenness, like two Serrati uh, uh, and uh, Tokar. They were in their khakis. They were drinking beer. They fell into a muddy ditch. They were filthy. Everyone was ecstatic. It's over. You're going home. And as Aunt Emma said, there's no place like home. But those, those two years, three birthdays across there changed everything. I come back. My brother was killed in a high school football game. My dog was killed in an accident. The girl who helped my mother died, a lovely person. My sweet grandmother died. Got a dear John from my girlfriend. For crying out, I come back, and they said, you, you want to go to a medical school? You better sign up now. So I went right from there, right to Loyola. And, uh, so you were able to use the GI Bill then? Yeah. Yeah, it was very fine. Yeah. Got did my tuition paid at Illinois. Went to Illinois Med School. Did you um, have an idea that you might be a doctor while you were in the uh, in the army? Yeah, the I on a board ship they had an appendicitis. I asked the guy if I could watch, and it was nicely done. You know, where are you going to take someone? You're on a landing craft. You're going to some island. Operated a board ship, and. Uh, yeah, I was uh, cut out and came back and accepted that the place was loaded with GIs, loaded. So um, after Iishima, um, Iishima, then it was Okinawa. Then it was Okinawa. So were you in the push south also on Okinawa? Yeah. Uh, they, we landed, we went south, and the... Uh, Marines went north because there was a, an airfield there. Casualties, very light. Most of the Marines said, Jesus, it's a picnic. Then they sent them south, and it was a juggernaut. They had every cave with entrances all over. They had one hill backed by two other hills, so the flanks and the rear were taken care of. They had these escarpment where they had their buried their dead and they cave openings, and they would close them off, put an artillery piece in there, open it, fire, before you could get any triangulation on it, closed it. And they had big guns, and we had a bombardment from the Navy, bombardment from Long Tom's artillery. The noise was horrendous, and then nobody could take that away, and the mud was there. You couldn't drag people out. It stunk. And they were fierce. And finally, at Shuri Castle, the unit got a presidential citation for taking that. It was the center of the line. So it was the living conditions plus an enemy that was fierce and smart, and they had tanks. It was a tank school over an hour. They, uh, so you were called, you, your unit was, was called on quite a bit then, whenever they had Yeah, well, first of all, uh, some of the guys were called up. Bob Tokar, I wasn't with him at that, at that time. Uh, he's still alive, and he's a great comrade of mine. He went back to Okinawa for a visit. They treated him beautifully, but it spoiled it. It's all a city. It's all built up. It's uh, hard to imagine the battlefield, and it changes your perspective. It's all a massive, just like Japan recovered from everything, too. But he was up front there as infantry. You lose your status. Uh, nobody needed an anti-tank gun up there. They needed people to hold the line. He was there, and he gets a, a call from uh, the lieutenant who was back at headquarters. What it were is that if it's 100 yards, you're much safer than what line companies are. And he had, uh, and he hung around there. He was a brown-nosing type of guy. Lack of warmth. Put a gun out. Off the sergeant came and said, you guys are not staying here. This is not a good position. In the open with mortars into the jungle that were throwing them up. So he changed our position. That was a great sergeant. He'd tell the 
three stripes up, two stripes down, that was stump. He'd tell him what he wanted, and he'd go, and he'd change it if he had to, to make it work. So getting back to Tokar, the, the officer was back. That's the kind of guy he was. He said, how's it going up there, Bob? He says, why don't you come down here and see? He said, I could court-martial you for that. He said, go ahead, and I'll tell him what you did during the war. The K Company had a magnificent officer. What a, a line company. He, his men loved him. He, he would be up with glasses. They said, Captain, Jesus, get down. And he says, well, someone's got to see what the hell we're doing. And we were, for them, that's when I got shot in uh, Cormac Bay. Uh, they were out of ammunition. They had some firepower and out of ammunition. They wanted water and ammunition. And so we took it up to K Company and got back okay. Then the sergeant said, you got to go back to K Company. I swore my head off, and he let me swear, and I went back to K Company. On the way back is when I got shot. Yeah, no. And Phil started to cry. I said, take care of my rifle, Phil. And when they sent me back, I asked to go back from New Guinea to my company. And we officer was sending me, he said, I can send you to Quartermaster if you want. I said, look, they get me in Quartermaster, and all of a sudden things go wrong. They'll look and see I was infantry, and they'll send me on with a bunch of guys I don't know. He said, send me back to my old outfit. I know the people there and trust them. And sure enough, Phil was getting a haircut under a coconut tree, tree and I came in. They didn't expect me back. I said, hi, Phil. He says, well, what do you know? And he would, he's a big, sensitive, big guy. Well, I got pictures of him in here. Yeah. Uh, after the war, we, we remained fast friends. All of these guys are all in here. So you received a bronze star for that? Uh, yeah, yeah, for uh, guiding the uh, squad. It's, it's written up there. Yeah. But then you They gave those out like water. I mean, you know, all you had to do is get shot or be in an action. The guy at the town said, you want a Bronze Star? I said, sure, because you get points to go home. So I got a Bronze Star. It, it, the way things are, the guys that really deserved it are the guys that didn't get much medal, but they were in a line company. A BAR guy, Ed, Ed Puhala, you see a picture. He was killed on Okinawa. He, battle after battle. No special medal, because he was doing his job. Our job was anti-tank, and bringing stuff up to K Company, coming back again and doing it, that was like not our job, so they passed out Bronze Stars. The, most of the medals, except one like Phil, where he ran out and directed tank fire on, on uh, these artillery pieces, got on top of the tank, much like the uh, the most decorated, Audie Murphy. In the face of everything, he's running around there. He's running, and he we got to take our mess kit, kit off. He had a bullet that went through the, it was spent in his mess kit. So, uh, but he was intrepid, and he was quite alert guy, and fast on his feet, and he directed tank fire. And I got the picture of him. All of them are you don't have to do anything with them, but I'm describing types of people that were out there that really had their wits about them and some special qualities. And um, you were promoted to staff sergeant. Because everyone else left and was killed. They oh, were going to send me to Japan. There you go. Who's going to come back from that? They were going to fight us with bamboo sticks. They had hordes of kamikaze planes. One of the things we did on Akashima, why were we sent there? Because it was a little like the Hardy Boys, the Hardy Boys at the secret airfield. This was the Hardy Boys. The Japs from intelligence had suicide bombs that were driven by a suicide pilot. They were going to sink the American Navy. They ran them up on railroad tracks into a cave covered with brush. But they were found out, so we went to Akashima, and uh, bomb squads blew them up. There's pictures of the K 
Kamak uh, with the uh, they're just big torpedoes. So Akashima is near Akashima. Akashima is near Japan. Akashima is in Karemareto. It's off Kyoto. Uh, Okinawa is maybe 400 miles. miles. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, so, so after ok after Okinawa is 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 finally taken, it's no, it's horrific cost. Yeah, horrific cost. Horrific cost. Then. Back to Cebu. Back to Cebu. To and, that's, and that's where you hear that the... The bomb. The bomb one and then bomb two. And then they... Well, we didn't know bomb two. We knew bomb one. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know there were two bombs. It probably was the second one because whoever had radio and officer and so forth, or we didn't get newspapers or anything. Someone must have had a radio and said uh, they announced that the war is over. That must have been the second bomb. Did you get any? Were you able to get letters from home or at yeah, all? Yeah, emails. The emails, yeah. Uh, someone wrote my mother a dear note because a dear high school friend of mine uh, went to Germany and she wrote a note to my mother and said, uh, "Well, she was worried too. Uh, I hope God brings them back and is on our side and they will get them German." She was a lovely French little lady, and I've got her uh, a copy of her in here too. The uh, females. You folded or wrote the letter, and the letter was the envelope. Closed it. Yeah, we got those, and eventually, when we went to occupation in Hokkaido, uh, I got a salami that was all white. <laughs> we peeled it off, made a stew. The so you went to Japan then? Yeah. From the Cebu, you went to the northern island of yeah. island of Hokkaido. Yeah. yeah, they were afraid the Russians? Rushkis would come up the Bering Strait. The Japanese were very fearful of them. But you have no idea how nice they were. They were saluting me with a staff sergeant thing on my helmet. I went to, I've got pictures of us in a little town of Asahigawa eating dinner with a newspaper. He wanted me to romance his daughter. Uh, I pictures all over the joint. A after all, you know, I had a pinhole camera with a hole in it, so some of them are a little blurred. But when things settled down, you'd get your duffel bag and whatever junk you had in it. So, um, Mr. Levin, how did you manage to get the sword home? Uh, <clears throat> Phil and I on Hokkaido were asked to uh, make a day room, you know, keep busy. Right? We didn't have to dig any latrines or garbage pits. They said, uh, there, here's the keys to a Japanese warehouse. Well, it was like opening a candy store. I sent back a Japanese long rifle box, filled box up for me, and sent uh, this back. It had a scabbard with it. And uh, my dad opened it like, boy, oh, boy. And that was hung on the wall for a while, and then I passed it on to someone else. I had an M1 that I bought as a memento. I gave it to another kid. When we moved, we've just skinned down, my wife and I, and just taking care of each other now. So, um, so then after Hokkaido, then you you uh, came home, demobbed, you're discharged, and yeah, that yeah. was. We went to uh, came Sapporo. home by boat, I suppose. You went to Sapporo, saw about. Uh, uh, Fuji, beautiful mountain in uh, off of Tokyo, I believe yes. it was, and went through to Yokohama. Sapporo was a lovely town, uh, and then got on a boat. Must have been five thousand other guys, but the deck it was warm. It was still. We came back close to Hawaii. Any anyway, the sun was shining on the deck. They were playing a song. Uh, Drinking rum and Coca Cola, working for the Yankee dollar. And what do you know? We had rum and we had Coke. You got a little lightheaded and you're so happy you're going home. The sun was shining, the guy's shirts were off. Uh, safety and lack of fear. Probably one of the primeval things in man's motivation is fear. It even overrides love, it overrides everything. Did you lose a lot of weight during while you're in the? Oh yeah, I got picture. I skinny down. Uh, I was, uh, I think, 140 or something. Then in, in in medical school I was 212. So Whoa. I put it back. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, that uh, was happiness. And even when you got back, we landed in California. Everyone kissed the ground. Then they had a... Want me to go on or... Yeah, yeah, I just want to switch the backup tape. Yeah. We had the, got into a line and they had steak. Mm. First of all, we got off the boat. There was the Red Cross. We didn't think much of them. Why? It was a, a kind of a funny outfit. They, they didn't, we didn't think they did much. They came with donuts on the cane and milk, and that's all I needed was milk. I had such cramps I couldn't believe. And uh, Phil and I were separating, and he started crying, and I, I had to go to the washroom. But then I saw him shortly afterwards. I went out to Oregon visit. It was a great, great scene there. And uh, I, we went in line. They had steak and French fries and all of the troops in their boots and stuff and coming through. And guess who they had serving us? German war prisoners. And one war prisoner, the guy said, throw out another steak for me. Plain line guy, gruff and tough. He said, I can only give you one. He took this guy, dragged him over the common. He says, you whatever expletives, you'll give me two steaks or you're dead. Okay, I gave him two steaks, but the, the hubris was still there. You think that they won the goddamn war. And that's why they bombed Churchill, bombed Dresden. Kurt Vonnegut may not like it. And who does like it to see people suffocated? The heat of the bomb didn't kill him, it drew the air out. And he got, Vonnegut got a buck fifty for every body he went in and took out. And he hated war, I don't blame him. But at the same time, if you didn't, it took all of Europe before anybody said something. Churchill, Chamberlain said, you know, maybe we ought to join him. Lindbergh said, let's join him. And the guy that owns the Kennedy, Oh, yeah, I'm ambassador of Germany. He's a nice guy, that guy. Yeah, and Churchill said, well, he may be nice, but when we go with him, he'll wring our necks like chicken. And he made the statement that everybody woke up to. Look what they, they firebombed England, and they're squawking because they bombed Dresden. Churchill said, you mark this. This is what you get, and you try it again, and we're going to do it again. And suddenly they're our best friends. And MacArthur made the Japanese our best friends. Well, look at those guys. But MacArthur went nuts. He wanted to attack the Ruskies. <laughs> I don't know all this stuff. So coming back to... Um, so uh, adjustment, you came back home and a lot of familiar faces and family are changed. We all but, uh, gathered at the Aragon Ballroom where Dick Jurgens sang in his big band. Does your mother know you're out, Cecilia? Does she know that I'm about to steal ya? Beautiful music. All the guys from all over came back as a meeting place, trying to get a dance with a girl, trying to make some time. And for a while, uh, everybody did, and then they started to run their different ways. So you you you, you released from the service then in uh, January of '46, yeah. And then you start uh, pre-med at Loyola. When in that that uh, yeah, that February I think it was. I was. Oh, well, you didn't waste any time. No. What was I going to do? Run around and do what? Yeah. I met my uh, my uh, wife, but it's in the neighborhood. Never, and never her, her brother was in the service in the Air Force. Had so she gone to Roosevelt also? Or? No, she went to Von Steuben. Von Steuben. And uh, it was up the road. It was yeah. a sister school, but right. they didn't allow football there. The, the principal was a lady. said, none of that business. You have a good soccer team. There's less injury. And they did have a good soccer and basketball. So I went with her while I was studying, and we went together a long time until... Her mother said, well, so when I was sure I was going to pass medical school after the junior year, we had to take comprehensive exams. The first two years, everything, then mostly clinical, uh, the, the senior comps, uh, that was hard but easier than the real scientific part the first two years. And then went to residency in Cook County a couple of years, Children's Memorial a couple of years, 
And then the and that, and that, and that lady is the is your wife. The, yeah. From the neighborhood. Now she's got Parkinson. I got every disease you can mention. I figure I'd talk to you before I knock off. <laughs> um, <coughs> so um, there's usually, you know, two questions that usually ask us to yeah, wind up the away. interview with. Or actually three. And if you want to censor me, go ahead. Oh, no. I've heard uh, you would be surprised. Uh, I can't censor myself. Yeah. It comes out anyway. I keep saying, don't swear. Why not? Because God doesn't like it. And then I wake up swearing. Yeah. So, um, if you stub your toe, what do you say? Yeah. Well, I, I say, even as a Jewish guy, Jesus Christ, that hurts. Yeah. Your proselytizing is great. Yeah. <laughs> I invoke them all the time. Yeah. I play handball a lot. It's just an anecdote. It has nothing germane to this. But there's a big six foot four rabbi, usually you're not that, with a little thing, and he wears a thing with the little tails on it and a hell of a player and a left-hand killer <clears throat> and so hard on himself. So he, he got a shot that the other guy picked up and killed. If you don't get it right, you know, handballs that way. So he, he said, Jesus Christ. So we got in the locker room. I said, Rabbi, <laughs> I said, what? I said, you're a good player, but do you know what you say when you miss a shot or you criticize yourself? He says, no, what? You say, Jesus Christ. He said, I do? <laughs> That's funny. And he was so sad when they placed him somewhere else. He had to move out of town. Uh, he was giving up his handball. <clears throat> yeah, it's a great sport. I think. Great sport. Well, the Irish. It's a game of fives. When I was in Glenendow, uh, in Ireland, which is a great place to visit by car. Glenelock? Yeah, Wicklow? Yeah, about 30 miles. Yeah, Wicklow. South of Dublin. It's a beautiful Glendalough. scenic. You can't believe it. It's like and a painting. And I'm going over a little cinder block bit, a bridge. And 180 degree, I said, hey, there's a handball. I got down. The Irish had targets, and it was so massive. We had a guy that played we the Irish whip. He'd unfold his shoulder and get the elbow in and the hand. Marvelous player, but it is, uh, the, uh, right now, the champ is an Irisher. Yeah. And a guy named Chapman was uh, that, and a guy named Paul, uh, I forget his last name. Anyway, there it was. I got a picture of myself in a you know, big court, much bigger than the indoor yeah. courts you see. Yeah. They're great players. Yeah. The um, one of the hey, one of the standard questions is, um, how do you think your military service and your experiences affected your life? Well, I I still swear a great deal when I want to express myself and make it succinct. And I often use the anecdote that, you know, when things are turning sour, you can say, oh, boys, let us get up and go out of here. Yeah. And uh, I say, I don't want to say it because it's it's not germane to you or yeah. people. But an expletive uh, yeah. is very appropriate. Yeah. And so uh, how did it affect my life? Well, there isn't a day that uh, something pops up. It doesn't take you back. Yeah. Uh, immediately, it could be almost anything. It's just like uh, a guy smells a perfume and he thinks of a girl. Yeah. Or some foul thing. Now, when some, and it's always people I go all over. I go to Bed Bath & Beyond shopping, and I get lost in these damn places looking for what I want. And someone will say, follow me. Well, I'm telling you, that's an infantry command. Raise up your arm, follow me. There was a, a lovely chap, a second lieutenant from I Company, and we were attached to I Company. He got in the position where the Japanese surrounded his platoon, and they were in the trees, they were in the holes, they were throwing grenades, they clink them on their helmet, throw them in. They had rifles and machine guns, and they were caught, and I didn't see this. I was uh, bedding down for the night. There was a big wide uh, track that a, a truck or something had made full of mud. I didn't have to dig anything. I laid down. It was wet and everything. And here were the guys on a jeep, one guy with a bandage, another guy in arm had been hit, and he was explaining to the intelligence officer, he said, what happened up there? He says, and the lieutenant, I played volleyball with him from I Company, and I wanted to be with the men. Good little athlete, red-headed guy. He said, so-and-so, uh, uh, 
he knew he had to get out of there. And he got up and he said, follow me. And they ripped across this chest with a machine gun. Follow me. Follow me. And I go to every damn store, and I can't get out of the habit of thinking this. He was a kid. He was 20. I was 18. And so he was an officer. So those, uh, there's, it's still around. I can recall vividly everything because it was very impressionable. I wasn't used to this. And I'm not like a five-year-old from the Muslim group where they're happy to die. They're going to get 72 virgins. The hell does a five-year-old kid do with 72 virgins? I'm not anti because I know there's good people amongst them. It's so hard to not to profile. Yes. Roosevelt did it, took yeah. our citizens, threw them in. They had the best regiment in Germany, the best regiment, just to show that they were good Americans. So there's a lot of uh, stuff I can't account for in my mind. Yeah. Um, Mr. Levin, how do you think your military experiences influence your thinking about war? Well, we just, uh, I, look, you have a right to defend yourself. I, I don't know. We have a war on drugs, a war on crime, a war on immigration, a war on terrorists. It's killing. I mean, you give it all kinds of names. Uh, oh, we're doing uh, something, brushing up here, taking them out there. It's, it ends up it's killing. There are killing fields. Kill, kill, kill. Is there another way? Well, I hope Obama succeeds. He's a thinking guy. Maybe he's on the right track. I wish him well. But you better be prepared, because these guys mean business. So there's that mixed feeling. You know, it's so hard uh, to come to a conclusion that you should be doing profiling on good people. Well, I think Teddy Roosevelt said it. Speak softly, but they have a big stick. Yeah. Where do you think we'd be, I question you, without our power structure? Do you think they'd let us alone? Well, it's amazing. You think that the United States was able to project its power across two oceans and knock out two formidable enemies. It's amazing, I mean, what, uh, what your generation accomplished. Well, there was motivation. I mean, when you saw the pictures and the yeah. bombs, everyone, everyone lined up to get in. Yeah. You don't find that. You find now a few good men. Yeah. Some paratroopers, some Marines, some soldiers from key outfits. People are just, are they doing anything with their, even my family with big cars and myself? You know, uh, uh, Keeler, uh, the guy that writes uh, from the Prairie Farm Station, Oh, Gary Garrison Keeler? Yeah. yeah, he wrote an article. He said, I was driving over in a plane, and I saw the oil fields. What an ugly sight to see all that oil down there. Then I said to myself, why, you're in one of the aircraft that's using that oil. It's spewing its stuff all over the place. He said, I got so confused and frustrated when I went home I got a, a big jug of chocolate ice cream and raspberries and ate it all up. I think the average person, I, all I see, I don't see any egg beaters out there. I see shiny cars, SUVs, guzzling gas. When do we come to our senses? Greed, I want it, I got to have it. I don't care if you got it or not, I'm going to top youism. And TV shows showing the, the distaff side of jerks and all these Hollywood sites. Oh, we're doing a great service. Who are you kidding? Jerry Springer's doing a great service? That piece of manure. John Wayne and Frank Sinatra, two more pieces of manure. And I think I'm right, cynical as I am, including myself. I'm driving an Avalon. I should be driving a kitty car, doing something for it. Yeah. Well, I, I did a few things. I went to Bolivia. I went to the clinics on Lake County. I serviced people with a chip on their shoulder, tried to be the physician and not judgmental. But I found it was an, 
exercising futility that I didn't accomplish much. The um, so what when you came out and then you went into the the education track and the professional track, yeah. did that still give you time to, or were you interested in like? the VFW or some of the veterans groups or they I was in medical school so and they came to, they wanted to draft me for Korea I said I didn't sign up for anything oh and uh, on top of it I'm in medical school so they let me alone a friend of mine served twice he served World War II and they got him back in Korea he was in the Navy but he had to bring the guys to the landing places yeah. We had one, one vet here. He decided when he got out of the Army, he'd go into ROTC for college. So he was down at Knox College in yeah. ROTC, and so he was off to Korea. So, yeah. I was in ROTC in high school. Oh, you were? Yeah. Ah. I became an officer, in it, but uh, we had a, a, a drill squad that was quite good, white yeah. belts. and. Yeah. But I, I think Crane High School at one time had a terrific... Uh, marksmanship team or something, a rifle team. Well, we had a, a rifles too. I yeah. had a rifle merit badge in the Scouts uh, on Fullerton Avenue just next to the Liberty Theater. We used to take our little 22 down and they'd ring out the target. Uh, that gave you some feeling, uh, but all of the guys I was with, Pennsylvanians, a couple of guys from Virginia, Kentucky, Oregon, and uh, Minnesota, they were all outdoorsmen, fishing, hunting, and use the food uh, that they got. Rabbits, they made rabbit stews, they got birds and pheasants. Yeah. So they were outdoorsmen, and I was happy, uh, and they were a little older than I was. Uh, the average age was three to five years older. So if I was 18, they were 21 to 23, more mature. I was glad to be amongst people who yeah. felt comfortable in the field. So Mr. So Mr. Uh, Hensley? Hensley, yeah. And Mr. Phil Hensley and Mr. Tokar? Yeah. You kept up with them over the years? There, yeah, uh, Hensley is gone now. He had diabetes. He, I was out there in Oregon State for a, quite a while, and they cut off his toes, then they cut off his shin, and then he said, that's it. And he had dialysis for a long time. One sweet guy. Now, I'll show you pictures. You'll get an idea. And you don't even have to include them, but you, you might just... For your own yeah, I would, yeah. Um, so at this stage, uh, we, we've reached the end of the interview. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, well, I would be stimulated by the little list I have, but yeah. that doesn't mean that you didn't get a pretty good idea. Oh, I think we did. Yeah, I'll I'll leave and then I'll say, oh, I forgot to mention. Well, let me let me just ask this as a kind of a provocative question or a couple of them. Uh, did you watch that? Uh, that HBO series this spring on the Marines in the Pacific? Bullshit. Yeah, even some of the Marines said that. Yeah. yeah. Here they are there, smart-ass guys, shows them making love to everybody in New Zealand. Well, we never were sent back to Hawaii. If someone got knocked off, a replacement came. If someone lost their stripes, you were the next guy up. What was there? They were going to take us to Manus Island for a beer and a volleyball game, the Army, and you had to have Mr. Citizen Soldier, who was without that mass. The Pacific was massive. First of all, it became in, uh, in Rabaul, there was trouble. New Guinea, there was trouble. There was trouble in Burma. These divisions were out there. Who the hell was it? wasn't the Marine barracks that were attacked at Pearl Harbor. It was Army. You needed Army. Lots of divisions. It was division against division. It wasn't a bunch of wild Indians running in and then running back and say they conquered an island. There were more casualties for the short time, if you read the brief on Aishima, than o Iwo Jima. They liked big numbers to show how many they killed. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that picture was not good. And they were quipping how, if they can't do good on D-Day, give us a call. You got outfits that would take and tear apart the Marines. You had paratroopers. You had Green Berets. You had Rangers. You had firepower from Germans. You had to take Germany first. 
That was the big one. With firepower, smarts, the Japanese were a mean bunch, and they, there was no, not much of a quarter. But that picture stunk. Now, I would say also the criticism of uh, finding Private Ryan, the invasion showed what it was like. But to go send the five Sullivan brothers died, they were on the ship. They made a beautiful picture about that, but that was horrible. So then this guy Ryan lost two brothers. They were going to save him. Who do you think they sent on a mission? Would you send a captain in charge of a squad? Two or three of the guys got killed. You send a tech sergeant, five striper, in charge of a squad to go through all the German lines and to find this one guy. And not only that, the guy works a two stripes on his helmet. You never walked up to a guy and saluted him. A sniper would knock you and him silly. You never even faced him and talked to him or eyeballed him. You didn't even pretend you were looking at him. You could talk to him on the side because you're going to draw fire. They send a the captain out there. There was a defect in the whole thing. Yeah. Hollywood eventually wins. They have to put in a slight love thing. They screw it up. One of the one of the Marines here, he objected strongly to that, and he wrote a letter to the uh, producer, he wrote it to Tom Hanks, and the guy called him back on Memorial Day, uh, and he spent 20 minutes talking to him on the phone. But this Marine said, the next time you write something about this particular outfit. You know, let's let's honor them as they should be. Strong letter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, we got uh, we were a good division that got along with them. Part of it was the rapport that our squad made, betting down with the Marines. Yeah. And we we wished them good luck, and we left, and we did our part as an Army division. On the hundred thousand that were on line, and the hundred thousand enemy, including Koreans and Okinawans and Japanese. Uh, and you couldn't take the bodies out. It stunk to hell. Uh, there were five army divisions and two marine divisions. This is on Okinawa. On Okinawa. Yeah. Now, take away the army, where do you think you'll be? Did you see the distances in the Pacific? Mm. There Vast. were 250,000 marines. A drop in the bucket. You can't control. The army was on Peleliu. They made a big thing of Peleliu. The army was there. Did you ever hear anything about it? No. They were on Yap. They were in Corregidor. The army was in Corregidor. They were in the Bataan March. You don't have to give them credit, but stop making out. America likes heroes and prettiness. So they make these false gods. Yeah. They were good outfits, well-trained, and just like the army, after they put their feet on the soil, they're the same damn thing. They carry a gun looking to kill a guy. Yeah. That's my take on it. So, but and I wouldn't down the Marines because we got along with them. Yeah. And they sent us what we needed, and vice versa. If you read these briefs, I started to read longer things, but the briefs will tell you why Guam, why Aishima, why Okinawa. All in one page. As your as your as your um, unit was being committed to these uh, to these battles, did you all know? Did you have the equivalent of that brief in your mind? Had it been communicated to you what the sense of what you're doing here was? The foot soldier. Did the foot soldier? All I knew is they were looking for landing strips where big bombers could go off and bomb the living daylights out. Yeah. Fire bombing. Of course, that works in Japan. They're all straw and bamboo. Yeah. Yeah. And the B-17s uh, and the B-29s, whatever it is. So we knew that our purpose was to get a landing field. And the Japs didn't want to give it up. So they're defending landing fields. That's all I knew. I knew that the guy in front of me, yeah. and I knew there was an objective, go look at those huts, go take Shuri Castle. Why? We're stuck there. That's where we got to take that. Then the line would be broken and we got Okinawa. Is there stuff to do afterwards? You bet. Yeah. A lot of rain on Okinawa. That's the infantry's thing. Rain. Mud. Yeah. Rain. Mud. Rain. Mud.
constant, and then you dry off in your own sweat. My feet were black. You think you took your shoes off? Where are you going, for a walk in the garden? They stayed in the boots. I had a pilot come on Guam. We were on a hill, and he low flying, and he had the wings. He was taking a peek at the, what it looked like to be on the ground there. And one officer from the Air Corps, when I, we got on the Oahu, over Pe Pass was the jungle school, so they assigned myself and Serrati to the jungle school. So what did I do? <clears throat> I tied the dynamite. There's a picture of the guy, so it would blow up, and the line company still go across the rope. And I got dizzy. I didn't know the nitroglycerin dilated your arteries and gave you such a headache you couldn't believe. And one sergeant said, hey, you should be wearing gloves when you handle that paste. Then I got into a, there was a hill. It was a jungle course already established. And there was a big sack, like a sack for a sack of potatoes, but filled with sand. It had rained, so the sack was on a pulley and it becomes like cement. I was in a camouflage hutch, and here comes an Air Force or a guy with his little Air Force cap, guided by a three-stripe sergeant with a pistol. The Air Corps guy had a pistol, and he had a bayonet and a rifle. And they're coming down this jungle path to be wary, uh, to show him what it's like infantry training. Well, they, they come to my camouflage little spot, and I had little quarter sticks of dynamite and caps that I'd throw out. The, uh, I let go of the pulley, and it came down. You could hear a squeak, ee, 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 and it came, must have been about 150 yards, speedier than hell, filled with sand, and it had rained. It was like a bag of cement, and it hit the uh, three-stripe sergeant from the infantry in the butt, in the middle of the back, and lifted him off the ground and onto the mud. He says, you son of a bitch, I know you're someone in there. He says, I'm going to poke my bayonet in. I hope I rip your guts up. I said, you do that, and I've got dynamite here. I'll blow your brains out. And he swore. The Air Force guy said, the hell with it. And he left, and the other guy went on. But well, why did you do that? Why did I do what? Uh, that was, I was supposed to do that. That pulley with the bag on it was the enemy. And if you didn't look out, you were going to hit, but not with a cement bag. It, it had rained, and it was muddy, and it was it hit him right in the back. I don't blame him for it. But that was supposed to be like a training exercise or something. Yeah, it was yeah. jungle school. Jungle school. What did I know from training jungle? I got in the sergeant. He said, here's the dynamite caps. Stuff this pasty stuff into the cap, and it's about a quarter of a something, like an airbag. Yeah. And throw it out there, and they'll give them a jolt and tie it on the ropes and yeah. jolt them. And so I, I spent uh, about six weeks in there. So that, that, yeah, as you were saying, that finding yourself in the jungle terrain with that climate is just unlike Sweaty. anything you've ever... We, we got lost again going down a, a ravine, lost from the line companies all by ourselves. And we witnessed on the side of a hill, I was cheering for the Japanese. The Marines, it was a like a little bay, but it was all coral and maybe about five deep. Two Japs, we had field glasses, were carrying a, a wounded guy across this bay. And the Marines were throwing mortars in front. They were, you know, blocking them in. Then in back, and I, we were hoping just because there are troops they were taking this guy across, maybe to where their camp was. And they boom, one and boom, another. And then what right on the three of them, and lakes and everything flying in. We kind of felt bad for them. They were uh, good soldiers, but they prepared for that all their lives. Guy wrote, when I was a kid, I read John Gunther's Inside uh, Asia. Yeah, he was a marvelous travel writer. Yeah, yeah, and he wrote, he said, you better wake up. He went to Japanese maneuvers with their hot boots. In a long march, they were jogging. And one guy fell, and they trampled him to death. He says, they got something here. You know, we let the whole damn Jap Navy come down the pike. A whole Navy. And they took every island. They took the Japanese and Manchuria and China 
and they were cruel, and they uh, got almighty. They took everything they could see, every island, Rabao, Burma, Yap, Peleliu. Oh, they were rampaging. Guam. Rampaging. So who the hell was watching it? And they park all the battleships together. You know, Roosevelt, uh, he okayed about the Japanese citizens. Hey, and we're worrying about profiling the most beloved leftist there was. I cried when he died. He was a father figure. But then in retrospect, I'm looking at this. Where was the guy? He's talking to the Japanese ambassador. And they're coming and they knock off Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And all he did with his hubris and fine speaking ability, he had a lot of good other ideas. A day in infamy, we will win. Well, you let it happen, you fool. And you got the gall to get up there and say, Tom Thumb, I stuck my finger in the pie. What a good boy am I? Well, he let us through it. He had me bawling. But in retrospect, with his cockiness, and he thought he could take Stalin and wipe him around his little finger and not to let his vice president know he's got a bomb. What kind of guy was he? Yeah. Well, Truman made the decision, though. Truman was artillery Morris from World War, War One. I. Yeah. You know the anecdote about him. I don't he was so. artillery. He was a captain in World War One. Pretty good rank. He bombarded the Germans. He said, okay, they're going to re-bombard and come back, attack us, move the guns. Couldn't move them. They were stuck in the mud. He says, we can always get other guns, but we can't get good artillerymen. Took his whole unit and marched away. Pragmatic, went to war, knew a couple of things, politician. But one thing about him, he recognized Israel. He was, a, it did stop there. He did stay what he's going to do. But he had faults, I suppose so. But right now, I think his name ought to live pretty good. Yeah, his, uh, I think his, um, his stock is still is rising at this time. There's an ebb and flow sometimes with these oh, historical sure. figures, I, but I think I, his is going know, up. These people aren't all bad or all good. Yeah. But uh, our heroes are our heroes. We, I don't know what we do. Well, it seems like World War II was um, a complicated, unforgettable, we resonating... Were all, all over the place. Yeah. It was worldwide. Yeah. It was in the desert, Al Alamein, with Rama, for crying out. There wasn't a place on the earth that someone wasn't having a hard time. And then the people here got tired of it. When I came back, the shouting was over. That's it. We don't want to hear about the war. So I made my own memorial, and then I, I, I take it back some of it when I read Kurt Vonnegut. Well, thank you much, very much, Mr. Levin, for a very, uh, a very generous and detailed interview. Yeah, and okay. I hope some of the young people read this, and I look forward now to making some copies of some of your material that we can yeah. interleave into the interview. Thank I you. had uh, an interview by a young chap who needed a a neighbor of my son's, and his interview is in here. Oh, great. A, a young boy. And I told him, I'll, I'll tell your son in my library what's what, but there's, I told his father there's going to be some swearing. He said, do whatever you have to. And I told the kid, I said, I'm going to tell you how it is from my viewpoint. And he wrote a, a beautiful book. OK, I think we're recording again now one more story that comes to mind. Yeah, there's a, a part in this book, a friend or foe, and it describes a guy who is fearful of someone coming into his uh, foxhole. We didn't have foxholes. We had grave-like things, two by six and a parapet. And the dread, uh, I believe, of any soldier is someone throwing a grenade in their hole or jumping in and stabbing them to death. And my fear was, how could I fight a guy for my life? I didn't know how that would be. Anyway, germane to that condition, we were in the open on uh, Okinawa, heading towards the last hills. And we had a gun set up 37 millimeter on a, uh, an open field. And it had a shield on it. And there was a little, it was like farmland. And it had a little pile of rocks. And this nice kid from a southern 
place. He was 18. By that time, I was 20. And in charge of the gun. And he said, hey, there's some guy walking up and back, and he's throwing grenades at us. I said, I heard him hitting the uh, tank shield. He says, what should we do? Well, I said, uh, he was against on these rocks, patrolling up and back with leaves in his helmet. Looked like a tree. And I said, next time he goes across, it's dark purple behind him, and he stands out like a tree. And he hit the grenade on his helmet. That was a giveaway. And he was short of us. We were about... Eight. Hitting the grenade, what did that do? That loosened that the pin or set the that's fuse? How they detonated or... it. Yeah, they had to hit it. And he uh, stopped. I said, next time he stops to the right, just line your gun up on the shield and we'll fire. And he stops and he hits one. And I said, OK. And we fired and the tree fell down. So in the, uh, that same night, the flares were up from the Navy to see if any enemy was moving. And you stood still. And I was. The flares were going out. They were naval flares or artillery flares, whatever. So everyone had a look, but you daren't move or get out of your hole. And I had my rifle in my hand after firing at this guy. And out at 180 degrees, I see a body outside about six feet away in an adjacent hole. I didn't know who the hell it was. And I turned, and I had my hand on the trigger. And I was about to fire, because I didn't know what body was out there. These flares were starting to dim. And the guy says, don't shoot, it's me. How the hell do I know who me is? And I said, what the fuck are you doing out of your hole? He said, I couldn't stand it. I, 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 I didn't want to be in there if a guy jumped in and started fighting with me or threw in a grenade. I thought I'd be better off outside the hole. I says, for Christ's sake, if you're going to do something like that, let the next guy know what the hell you're doing. And so that I, if I had killed one of our own soldiers, and it could easily happen, that would have been it. So, and in the morning, the kid says, let's go out and see what happened to that guy. I said, I don't want to put that in my memory bank. I'm not going. He hops out. He says, holy cry, when he comes back. His chest was all blown out. What a thing. He must have taken a grenade and blown himself up, in addition to being fired and knowing he was in dire trouble. So I didn't put that in my memory bank. But the rest of it is in there. And I'm glad I didn't. Another yeah, thing there were some instances of what you, would you call that friendly fire where well, I've, friendly fire. I've heard some horrible stories where the, the new guy's being shown around. They come back, and there's a new guy on the line, and he doesn't say the password. And then we had a guy. They transferred him to quartermaster. They had a, a, a officer and two sergeants go out as a recon for the night. They said, when we come back, we'll flash a blue light. They flashed a blue light, and this guy killed all three of them. He was going to be killed anyway, the other guy. They sent him back to division, the quartermaster, because someone had killed him. And World War, the, the lost battalion was almost decimated by their own bombardment coming back, back, back almost up to them. Well, that's one thing about artillery and mortars. There's nothing you can do. you got to just suffer. I had a great friend who was a captain. He was quite honored for his... Uh, he was from Crane Tech, and he made him an intelligence officer, sent out with two sergeants to guide Bombardment from ships, bombardment from artillery, and bombardment from mortars, seeing that they went to the right place and did the right thing. And he uh, he told this story at a meeting after the war with other people. Handsome guy, looked like Alec Baldwin. Calm guy, and, and they came across Japs, and they took the maps away. And to make sure that the Japs were dead, his sergeants were shooting them in the head. And he said, look, Sergeant, he says, I don't mind you making sure they were dead. He says, instead of making all that noise, couldn't you just slit their throats? <laughs> so he told that anecdote. But he said, one day, he got a call from an infantry outfit. On the other side of a hill, guys were throwing mortars over. And he said, they couldn't get at them. 
He says, do you, we know that you've got artillery and a ship out there. Do you think you could quiet that machine gun and the mortar? He said, sure. So Al, he said, I spent a half a million bucks. And the guy called me back. He says, they're quiet now. <laughs> he says, I threw in so much stuff. But he did get a very high commendation. He visited me on Leyte. Ooh, company, uh, a captain comes in. He, he, his, his brother was killed in Anzio. His other brother was in the 80th Armory. And the, the uh, clerk in uh, our company said, hey, there's a captain here, you see. And he had his two bars, and he came in. He says, yeah. I said, I heard from Ronnie. We chatted a while. And he was in a boxing uh, ring giving a lecture. And he had a way of telling stories that was great. And in the ring, I said, that's Al Wainfield. He says, now, when you're aboard ship, you will wear two canteens. You're just going to have breakfast and supper. You'll disarm your weapons. You'll do this and that. And I didn't know whether to salute or not. I said, Al? He says, yeah, Jerry, what are you doing here? I said, I'm with the 77th. He kept track of it and visited me on late day. And then we all got together at the house. The four brothers that were left or five, all in the service, and uh, all slept in the same bed after the war. It's hard to get an apartment. And Al told these uh, anecdotes, and it was just a great reunion. It's something memorabilia. Still up, still yeah, up there. Still in the files. Thank you. Yeah. A tank ambush on Guam? Yeah, we, we came up the last place to be taken was uh, a, a bivouac area of the Japanese. And they, it goes, it's on in here in total description, but we came up, put the gun down, and the Japanese, I, you don't have to record, I'll just briefly tell you. We came up, we set the gun down on a road. That road into the jungle was a 42 millimeter anti-tank gun, a machine gun, and a uh, Japanese tank. And they were pushed by, and you couldn't see them from the road. Uh, a guy, Kimbrell, he was a football player uh, from someplace. He was a colonel. Uh, and across from that, here's the road, here's the Japanese and stuff. Across the road, the Ameri here's a bivouac area loaded with Japanese that had been bombarded, a lot of them killed. But the tanks moved across the road and fired on the bivouac area. But their rear of our tank, two American tanks, were bombarded by these people here. But what they didn't do is have their rear protected. And the guy heard the firing of the Japanese and came up with flamethrowers, machine guns, and burned the tank. We came after the battle was over. They got uh, a couple of Americans were killed trying to get out. A couple were bleeding and died later. But they removed these guys from their tanks, got them all out. The Japanese tank was burned uh, by a flamethrower. The guy was in there, all charred up, his teeth showing. I went out and I dismantled a, a Nambu machine gun from the tank. It could have been booby trapped. I don't know what the hell. Yeah, I, and I took that souvenir, put it in the Jeep, and on the airfield in Guam, they gave it to the Seabees. They cleared our area. I said, well, so there you are. You know, I, what was I going to do with the damn Nambu machine gun? I don't know. And I went up and looked at this Jap, and his teeth were showing, and he's burnt to a crisp. You know, I could see what the battle had done. That impressed me a, a, a lot. And then someone, some fool was driving that road at night, so we fired our 50 caliber in front. We didn't know who it was, but the thing, you could hear it screech on a dirt road. Backed it up, didn't even turn around. Backed it as fast as he could. Uh, and that was Mount Santa Rosa. And it just, that so was that a Jap, do you think that was a Japanese Jeep? Or, or oh, I don't know who no. it was. I once, until we were on the road, dug in, and a, a car's coming. You could hear it coming. And I'm tracing it with my 50 caliber until I saw an American star on it with slits, you know, for lights. Could easily it blown your cool and knocked out a, a, your own yeah 
but these are images stuck in there, and that tank thing very brightly because seeing that Japanese guy and these Americans decided to go around the rear, came across them, had flamethrowers, machine guns, and just burned the hell out of them. Yeah. They made mistakes too. That thin red, red line was an interesting picture with uh, Nolte. Oh, Nick Nolte? Nick yeah, Nolte. I can't recall it. I and remember the title. John Penn was in it, and how an officer did the right thing with his men, found a weakness in the Japanese, got the pill box because he was smart, but uh, he wasn't what Nolte wanted. He, Nolte was headstrong about being a general. He wasn't up on line. He it was a crazy picture. I saw it in France for the first time, but it's called The Thin Red Line. You recommend it? It is, the battle scene trying to take the pillbox was quite real. Uh, one guy couldn't stand it anymore, uh, hiding behind a wall, and the Jets were coming by, and some were engaging other guys. He just went nuts, and he ran to the pillbox, threw in a grenade, like Phil Hensley, a uh, uh, big American kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a very interesting take on, on situations where people are being sent in different places by higher people, and they got different motivations, and they're all nuts. <laughs> they're all nuts. <laughs> all nuts. Thank you.